Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. Welcome to New Covenant Church Online Experience. And uh, I want to take a moment before we get into the sermon to talk about uh, my outfit today, what I'm wearing. Uh, this is the first time I've ever preached in shorts and a t-shirt and a ball cap and sunglasses in this sanctuary. In fact, six months ago, I can't ever imagine a scenario where I would do that for our Sunday service. But in the last six weeks, we've been doing an, an in-person sermon out back behind the building on the back of a trailer and it's hot out there and so our worship team is wearing hats and sunglasses because they're staring straight into the sun all of our preachers have been using shorts and t-shirts and I just thought it'd be fun to share with our online community what our in-person community how that sort of feels and when I was in the Marine Corps we, we had several different uniforms and every day there was a, a uniform of the day and so today's uniform of the day is going to be casual outdoors. And, and I, one of the reasons I wanted to do that is just to show us, we're going to be talking about the new normal, and to show us that there was a way we used to do church. Everybody, like 50 years ago, everybody used to wear a suit and tie when they came to church. They would give their Sunday best. They would dress up and give the Lord their Sunday best. But then in the last 20, 30 years, things became way more casual, jeans, shirts uh, untucked, uh, a little more trendy. And then now, the people that I'm seeing that preaching in tents or people who are preaching outdoors, they're going very casual, shorts, sunglasses, stuff like that. And, and what we're seeing is, is that God's presence is available no matter what you wear. And so we got to be careful in this season not to fall into a religious spirit and try to act like we have in seasons past, because God has proven to us that if we come with a humble heart, and we bring God our best, God shows up and his presence is just as available today as he was 50 years ago. I don't ever want to be disrespectful. I don't ever want to be crude, but I do want to be natural and normal and know that God is with me everywhere, whether I'm preaching on the platform or going for a run around Lake Junaluska. So I hope you'll enjoy today. I'm going to look pretty casual today. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get into, we're into our next sermon on the holy hybrid, the new normal. We're trying to figure out some rules or some principles leaning forward what the new normal is going to look like. And we're using this um, scripture from Matthew 13, and it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let me pause there for a second. It said the angels will separate the wicked from the righteous. It, but it says that we're to go catch fish of all kind. It's our job to reach out to everyone of all genders, all kinds, all, all behaviors, and we reach them for Jesus Christ and let the, door, the Lord do the sword. And I want to throw a wide net that reaches lots of people that don't look anything like me. And it says that the angel will throw them in the fiery furnace. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who's been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. And here's our blurb for this month. We are not going back the way things used to be. We're going forward with some old and some new. This is not an either or, but a both and, and maybe even a third view. I am more and more convinced that there are some things from our past that have made it through the fire that are going to be part of our future. But I also believe there are certain things that are brand new that are, are they're going to come forward. They're going to replace some things of the old. And we got to be careful that we don't, we don't throw out the new strategies and the new things that God wants to bring us because we're uncomfortable with them because we didn't have them in the old. So we're going to have old, we're going to have new, and then I think we're going to have even a hybrid, a third option of those things mixing together that create something we've never seen before. So today, my sermon's called The New Normal. And I want to talk about some things that I believe that spiritually we can lean into where new rules, new strategies, new principles that we can hold on to as we move through these uncertain times in the second half of 2020. And what I want to do is I want to use one of my favorite scriptures. I'm going to read this favorite scripture. I'm going to preach 
five or six quick points from this scripture, and then I'm going to preach my sermon. <laughs> so I've got some points. I've got my sermon. I'm going to preach some new stuff. I'm going to share some old stuff because a lot of us uh, online have not been in, uh, with New Covenant for years. So I'm going to share some important things that come out of this scripture. So join with me in John chapter 6. And it says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs he was doing for the sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Jesus already knew what he was going to do, but he asked this question to test Philip. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, this, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but where are they with so many you know, you think about this for just a second. It took guts for Andrew to say, hey, we got a guy over here and he's got five loaves and two fish. I mean, just that is just hilarious to me that Andrew had the guts to tell Jesus, we got a little something over here to work with. And Jesus had had the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down about 5,000 in number. And Jesus took the loaves and he had given thanks. He distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish as much as they... I'm sorry, let me go back. And it says, so also the fish as much as they wanted. That's key, that's important. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. This is one of my favorite passages. And before I get into my point, point one, I, I want to say a couple of things. Number one, a kid was the hero in this story. And that's really important. I want our, our children to understand that a child in the hand of the Lord is enough. God Almighty can work miracles through preachers. He can work miracles through doctors. He can mi work miracles through professors. But God is not limited to man's education, uh, his skill sets. God can take a child and change the whole environment around them. That's why at New Covenant, we do not believe that children are the leaders of tomorrow. We believe that children are the leaders of today. Start grooming them and start empowering them and cause them, release them into service and ministry right now. And God with a child can do anything. There is no junior Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that lives in the life of a saved five-year-old. Therefore, all things are possible with our kids and with God. So we've got to let God move, move through our children because he can do powerful and mighty things if we will trust the Holy Spirit in our children. Second of all, don't underestimate what God can do with the little that you have. Andrew took the guts to come to Jesus and say, I know there's 5,000 people out here, but I got a boy. He's got five loaves and two fishes. Now, the cool thing was, is that was the best answer any of the disciples had. Uh, no one else had a better answer. And Jesus was willing to take what they had and says, I can work with that. Many times we disqualify be ourselves because of what we possess and what we see. But a little in the hand of God can be multiplied to meet the great need. Uh, it was a widow who had a little bit of oil who ended up filling all the pots and pans that she had in her house and those of her neighbors. It was a, wo a widow that had a little bit of oil and a little bit of meal that was able to feed the prophet herself and her son for many, many days. And in this circumstance, a, a boy brought his lunch and God says, I can work with that lunch and do a great and mighty thing. The third thing says that Jesus knew that what he was going to do, but he asked Philip to test Philip. And here's the thing that I've heard my pastor say, God never asked you a question for his information. Every time God asks you a question, it's for your information. So Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He already knew he was going to do a miracle. He was going to feed these people. He not only was healing the sick, 
But now he wants to take care of their bellies. He wants to feed their bellies, nurture them, care for them. He already knew what he was going to do. But he asked Philip, Philip, where can we go buy food for all these people? Because that's the natural solution. He was offering Philip the natural solution. And Philip is like, sir, there is no store big enough around here. And there's not enough money to feed all these people. There's no way in the natural that this is going to work. And then Jesus takes the foys his two fishes, his five loaves, and says, that's why we're going to do it in the supernatural. One of the things I feel strongly about in this new season is the need for us to lose dependence upon the natural solutions and lean into the supernatural because a little in the hand of God is enough. The fourth one is that everyone ate a different amount, but with the same result, they all got full. It says they all ate until they were full. And so one of the principles that, that we talked about the last couple of years here at New Covenant Church has changed my life. And I know there's some people watch, right now watching, and I, and I want you to really lean in on this. this. This has changed the game for me, the way I see God, the way I see people. So I was in Egypt um, uh, several years ago, and I was teaching a class on leadership. And uh, one of the, the missionaries there in Greece, Gail Stathis, as I'm talking to this class on leaders, and it was a pretty informal class, as I'm talking to this class on leadership, they were getting their master's degree, um, I said that God loves me the most, we're all tied for first. That's what I said. I said, we're all tied for first, but God loves me the most. I'm his, I'm his favorite. And she challenged me on that. And she says, do you really believe that God loves you more than anybody else, even though you still say you're tied. And I said, yeah, God loves all of us equally. And she says, I don't believe that. And I had just read this passage. I had just the week before been on a prayer walk. God took me to this passage, told me what he wanted us to do as a church, use this passage as an example, as a pattern, um, and as a format, as a grid. And so I had this, this passage in my heart all week long because I was getting ready to come back to the U.S. and preach it. And so I, I was thinking through this lens, and I said, God loves everyone equally. And she says, I don't believe that. I believe God loves everyone uniquely, that God loves every person to the fullness of what they can handle. Some people can handle a little bit of love, but some people can handle a lot more love, and God does not hold back. God gives us liberally to the, to the fullness of what we can handle. And I began to look at this scripture, and it says, they all ate until they were full. I don't know about you, but in our family, we all eat a different amount of food to get full. So we can eat until we're totally full, but at the end of the day, it's a different amount. And I saw it in this scripture and what Gail had said about God loves us uniquely. So that means that we, as the body of Christ, have to work hard to get the lid off where God can love us so we can love God, love ourselves, love our neighbor. But God loves every one of us uniquely. And then the last thing is the abundance of leftover was more than what they started with. God is not stingy. God is liberal. God is generous. God started with a need to feed 5,000 people, a little boy with two fishes and five loaves. But when he was done, there were 12 baskets of leftover for the 12 disciples to carry away. God did not just meet the need. God went beyond the need to, and to, to the, to, he went as far as the restriction of how much his disciples could carry. We have this mentality of, I hope God will show up and bless me a little bit. God doesn't want to bless you a little bit. He wants to supply the fullness of your needs and then give you leftovers on top of that because he's a good, good father and he rewards those who diligently seek him. This is the God that we serve. Unfortunately, the church world has gotten so caught up in the poverty mentality that we that we've lived under and expect so little from God when indeed God wants to bless us don't you know that little boy went ha went home happy that day going mama you won't believe what happened today but don't you think there's some old men went home happy that day saying I've never seen anything like it in my eyes he took two fishes and five loaves he blessed it he broke it he gave it to his disciples they gave it away and next thing you know we were all full and there was 12 baskets left over. That's my God that I serve. All right, point number one, in this new normal, the parents got promoted. 
Now, it may feel like they're carrying more burden than they've ever had before, more responsibility, but the Lord did some shifting around in three groups of people for sure. One are parents. God promoted parents and says, parents, you are now the priests of your home and you're also the teachers. So you are responsible for these little ones. God moved the parents up front. At the same time, teachers got promoted too. We have never valued teachers like we do right now. When this pandemic hit, not only were the the teachers caring for the students, helping them get situated, helping them get back home, they were also then taking buses and delivering food to to local neighborhoods from, from the kitchen to the neighborhoods because those kids needed food. They were also trying to figure out how to get online and how to serve them. The teachers have just been unbelievably important in this season. And it's been amazing watch people say, man, at the end of this pandemic, we need to give teachers a raise. They deserve more money. They've been doing too much out of their own pocket. They don't get paid enough. They, they take great care of our kids. Uh, I, I saw one meme on, on Facebook and, and my mom posted, you lied. You said my kid was a blessing to work with. <laughs> you sent him back home to me and he's not as big a blessing as you told me he was. Uh, teachers have such grace of working with the kids. And in this season, we've, as, as, as we, the pandemic hit, we've watched respect for the teachers and school officials go up. And then we've watched the school officials and teachers take it to a whole nother level. Whole, we see the value of teachers in our community. And, and, and the third group of people is pastors have sort of been moved to the side a little bit. We've not been kicked out. We've not been, we've not been demoted, but we've been moved to the side. And the Lord said, listen, Your job is to equip my people to do the work of the ministry. Your job is not to be the savior of the world. It's not to take the place of of an ungodly father or an ungodly mother. Your job is to get out of the way and let me go directly to my people. And you come alongside and encourage them and build them up and give them resources and let the parents be the hero of their own story. I see that very clearly in this season. So, uh, and and, you know, here's the thing is that every household is different. In fact, here is rule number one. I, I promise you this one rule you can bank on moving forward. And that is all sizes. I mean, sorry. Um, um, one size fits all doesn't work anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. From now on, we're going to have to uniquely deal with situations. I don't know one school system that's, that's mimicking another school system. They're all doing something different. I, I see 12, 15 different ways churches are coming back, uh, uh, gathering back together. Some have come all the way back, just like they were from the very beginning. Some of them are social distancing in the building. Some people are meeting tents. Some people are preaching outdoors. Some people are doing drive-in. Some people are still doing online. Some people are doing uh, small watch parties. Everybody's doing something different. Same thing with parents. We've got, we got parents who are, who are trying to stay home and be with their kids. Other parents having to go to work and leave their kids behind. We have some parents like five families coming together to form their own co-op and hire a teacher to teach their kids. The, you cannot do one size fits all anymore. We got to figure out what's right for us. And that puts us at God's love and his mercy. We can't just look around and see how everybody's doing anymore. We have to pause and think for a second, what is it that God would like for me to do? And there's two stories I want to tell you in this. I've always said, number one, I've always said that the job of the parent, the primary job of the parent is, is, is of course, uh, basic trust, unconditional love, uh, to love our kids no matter what their behavior is. I, I believe that's number one. But number two is to know the unique brilliance of your child understand their destiny, and then set them up for success. It, it is, is helping our children find their brilliance where they're completely different than everyone else, come alongside of them and help them see where they're going and then uniquely setting them up for success. In the old days, we just put 30 kids in a classroom. We taught them one teacher, one curriculum, and some of them thrived. My older son thrived in that school system. But my younger son did not thrive. You couldn't hold his attention. He was daydreaming. He was trying to get out of class. He didn't want to do his work. But we had one way of training kids, just one, and some did well and some did not. 
in this season, it's like every family is different. Every school system is different. Everybody's got different technology abilities. And we're now having to figure out how to help each one of our kids figure out how to excel with education. And like I said, there's many different ways to make that happen. One size fits all does not work anymore. We're even as a church, we're, we're doing online service. We're doing in-person service. We're doing watch parties. We're getting several families together. We're doing all these different strategies to try to reach our people. And, and so th this new season is one size doesn't fit all. And, and, and businesses and churches and even families try to put a one size all fit on their people, you're going to lose some good people because that day's over. We're going to have to get creative. We're going to have to uh, do some new stuff. The other story is, and, and I've talked a little bit about, um, about this, but I have two African-American friends, both guys, and, and one of them does not want me to notice his skin color. He wants to be, uh, he wants me to just see him as a guy. Hey, I'm a guy, you're a guy. Uh, you don't even need to bring up my skin color. He also wants to be called African-American. He wants me to understand his African heritage. I, the other friend of mine, he, he wants to be black. He doesn't want to be African-American. He wants to be half, half American anything. He wants to be, I'm black, I'm full American, I just am black. And I want you to know my heritage and my culture and ask me about where I come from because my black experience is different than your white experience. Let's get to know each other and then celebrate each other's uniqueness and difference. So I asked one of them, I said, I don't understand. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get this thing right. Do I call a black person a black or do I call him uh, African-American? I don't know what to do with that. And he said, you should know each of your black friends uniquely so that you can treat them however they want to be treated. Brilliant. I'm trying to figure out the, the right thing to do so I don't offend anybody, the easy thing to do, uh, the generic thing to do. This new season is not about generic it's not about generalization. And because like racism, all racism is treating people through a general lens instead of getting to know that person one-on-one. -on -one. So I really feel like what God is gonna do is God is gonna teach us how to love in a new way where we get to know each other individually. And from knowing each other individually, then we can figure out how to celebrate each other and how to treat people uniquely. Wouldn't that be amazing? It almost sounds like the 99 and the one. That, we, that, that what works for the, one, the 99 doesn't necessarily work for the one, but the one is worth us treating them uniquely. So in this new season, parents got promoted. God said, my family, family matters to me. Family's important to me. And, and parents, God's given us these beautiful children and, and, and we know that they don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord. They're on loan. We get to steward them. And I've recently realized we get to steward them forever. <laughs> they, they, they don't, you don't stop parenting them when they move out your house. They, you, they still need love. They still need encouragement. They still need parenting. But in this season, God has shifted all these things around. And I've told our staff, listen, pastors are important, but our job is to make sure the parents are supported, that they're the heroes of their, of their own home, that, and that we help them do well in parenting their children and being the priest of their own family. So that's point number one. Point number two. Sorry, reconnecting. Every member a minister in every home a ministry station. Dr. Harvey was asked 20 years ago. He was with the Lord, and the Lord asked him a question. He says, if I could do, give you anything, if you had one prayer that would change the landscape of Christianity, would change the kingdom, game changer, uh, if, I, if I could give you one answer to one of your questions, what would that be? And this is what he said. He says, if every member was a minister and every home was a ministry station, it would be a game changer. It, it, instead of bringing all these sheep into the house and feeding them and sending them away for another week, if, if, the, if the body of Christ could come into the sanctuary for the purpose of being equipped 
and trained. Then they go back out and every church member saw themselves not as a receiver, but as a giver, as a minister. And then every home, in every, in every Christian home in the neighborhood was a ministry station, was its own local church. If we began, if we moved into a neighborhood and said, this is my parish, this is my church right here. These are my people. I go to the church building to get equipped and trained so that I can minister to my neighbors. That's my job. Dr. Harvey said, if, if we ever got to that mentality, then we would change the game. Folks, we're closer than we've ever been before. This pandemic has, has afforded us that opportunity to see ourselves as ministers and also to see our homes as ministry stations. Early on in this pandemic, we immediately began to see parents, we're going to give you some tools, but you're going to be the priest of your family. You're going to lead them in communion. You're going to gather them around the TV as we do worship, and, and you're going to help your children process. The, and, and then we began to say, hey, can you invite your neighbors over to maybe watch with you? That this, this, is, this is happening right here, right now. The old model before COVID was come and see. We, we invited people to come to church, come and see. We, we want you to come sit next to us at church. We want you to hear the preaching and watch the worship. Just come and see. This new season is go and tell. It, it is not about us receiving. It's about us going and telling the world about our wonderful Jesus. It's finding our testimony. It's testifying to his goodness. It's reaching out to our friends and family who are, have more fear, more uncertainty, less things to put their trust in than ever before. And we know Jesus. This new move is about us not coming to be, we used to talk about self-feeders. There was a, a movement of maturing churches that say, what we need to do is teach our people to be self-feeders. If we can teach them to pray and hear God's voice, if we can teach them how to fast and move God's heart, if we could get, teach them to read the word of God for themselves, we have arrived. If we can teach our people to be self-feeders, we have arrived. That was pre-COVID. Now the bar has been raised. Now the bar is if they can be providers of ministry, not just self-feeders, but if they can turn around and be ministers of the gospel and provide the gospel, that's the new bar. The bar's been raised because of this. I, it, it just amazes me that what the devil meant to do through a disease, God is using to build the muscle of the church and strengthen the church and says, you're not going to sit in cushiony chairs anymore. You're not just going to be self-feeders, but I'm going to push you back out of the nest. I'm going to make us all have to work a little harder. But as you do, you're going to be a provider of ministry and people around you are going to start seeing you as a pastor, you as a minister, you as someone who has the word of life and the gospel and the goodness of the Lord. These are some of the things that the Lord is doing in this season right now. He has totally changed the game. The job of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And more of that is happening than ever before. I preached a sermon just a couple weeks ago that the Lord wanted us to become spiritual storehouses, store up a little extra so that we could become resource centers. This week, Pastor Herman, our children's pastor, he called me and said, hey, I need you to find me a truck with a lift. And I'm like, sir, senior pastors, I don't run around looking for trucks with a lift. What's going on? And he says, sir, you have relationships in this community. I need a truck. I need it now. I need it fast. And I said, what's going on? He said, the Walmart in Silva has called us and said, if we can get a truck over there tomorrow, they're going to give us $20,000 worth of school supplies that we can give away to our community. 20000 I just preached on be a spiritual storehouse and God will make you also a resource center. Because Herman has been giving away school supplies every year since he's been here, he's already positioned himself as a person who gives away to the community. So when Walmart needed to unload $20,000 worth of school supplies, they called someone who was already doing the stuff. And so Herman now is loaded. He's loaded for this year, for next year, because he was already doing it. And that's why I want, I want to say something to us real quick. We've been very light 
uh, about encouraging our people to give tithes, offering, alms. I came on early on this pandemic and said, man, you do what you got to do. That's between you and the Lord. I'm going to change that just a little bit. I don't want you to miss out on the blessing and what God's doing right now. Bring him two fishes and five loaves and see what he does in your life. I'm watching testimony of testimonies and testimonies popping up around me. Herman is a proof of that. We gave away, we needed to raise $8,000. We raised $8,000. We gave away $8,000 worth of stuff. And within a couple of weeks, 20,000 more stuff's back in the coffer. If you've not been giving in this season, I want to challenge you, put some seed in the ground. Just put some, I don't want money from you. I want money for you. I want the blessing of the Lord on your life. And I don't want you to miss the blessing of sowing in a time of famine and reaping a hundredfold. So I'm going to challenge you, get some seed in the ground. And number three is the church has left the building. We are deployed. You know, I had, I had a couple people challenge me pretty early in this thing. They said, man, the church is closed. I said, the church isn't closed. The building's closed, but the church isn't closed. They said, yeah, the church is closed. There's not even a service on Sunday morning. I said, yes, there is. We're putting down a service on Sunday morning. The church is not a building. The church is not a service. The church is relationships based around Jesus Christ. It's my relationship with him, your relationship with him, and our relationship with each other. The church never got shut down. The church just simply got deployed out into the community. Suddenly we began to figure out how am I going to get fed? What, what's going to work in this season? Who are my people? How can I reach out to other people? How can we partner together? There was a lot going on. So let me just give you a couple of thoughts as I wrap this up. I want you to think about the military for a second. Um, the military was never created for garrison. It was always created for war. It was never created to sit around in a base and just train all the time. The, thank God when there's not a time of war, when we get the opportunity to train and, and, and to exercise and do the things that we need to do. But the purpose of a military is to fight wars. We, we do the things in garrison because we're going to go to war one day. And, and I was never a good uh, garrison Marine. There was too many foot locker inspections and parade decks and too much dog and pony shows. We're constantly doing some kind of inspection. I wanted to be out in the woods somewhere actually doing the stuff, getting ready for war. That, that was me. I always wanted to be out there doing the stuff, not sitting back on base preparing to do the stuff. Well, we spent a long season as the church, particularly in America, on base, in garrison, doing inspections. Now we're out in the field. Now we're at war. Now we're being deployed. Now we're facing a disease. And the answer to disease is the stripes that Jesus took on his back. I say, Lord Jesus, stand up, take off your robe and show the devil your back. You already paid the price for this disease and every other disease. In fact, they named this disease. Its name is COVID-19. They named this disease. But everything that has to name has to bow itself below the name of Jesus Christ. We place it at the foot of Jesus right now. We are fighting against spiritual principalities, darkness, rule rulers of this world. The church has been deployed. He wants us out in our neighborhoods. He wants us prayer walking. He wants us to do spiritual warfare. He wants us calling down and declaring the will of God upon our earth. These are the kind of things that God wants us to be doing right now. So we must start measuring. This is another thing. This is another rule that I believe a, a new law, a new normal. The church has to measure its success by its impact outside the walls, then its growth inside the walls. In the old days, we used to measure by, by how many people we had, uh, how, how big the budget was, how many salvations we had. Now, in this season, it's how much does our church impact our community and solve our community's problems. There's a whole different method. Since we are deployed, our measurements can't come from base anymore. It has to go from the field. And that's what we're doing as we're leaning in. So here we are. Try, and, and, and one of the other things we're seeing is, is that the church is not defined by the walls where we gather. The church 
is now other believers who gather in other buildings. We are seeing now that pastors working with pastors and people working with people, we're watching people float around from different churches. We're watching some people not connect with just one church. They're connecting with several churches. The, the body of Christ has changed in the last six months. There is more unity. There is more partnership with the pastors. And now more people are finding their identity, not in one congregation, but belonging to the bigger global church. And I think it's beautiful. So I think some of the new normals are one size doesn't fit all, uh, that we're going to have to uniquely treat people. We're going to have to get to know people relationally so we can treat them uniquely instead of just through generalizations. I believe that we're no longer come and see, but we're go and tell. We're no longer self-feeders, but we're self-providers. We're, we're providers of the ministry. Uh, we're no longer go to the church. We are the church, even while we're at home. And I believe that, that we're no longer just sitting at the base getting trained. We're actually deployed and at war right now. Now, and it's time for our church to rise up and to do the things that God's called us to do. And what an honor and privilege it is to be part of the move of God that's happening in 2020. I can't wait to see what God does with our two fishes, our five loaves, and to see how many people he moves into the kingdom and even what the leftovers are going to look like. It's going to be mind-boggling. It's going to be staggering what God does in this year. All right, let's, let me pray for us. Papa, we love you and we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness over our lives. We thank you that you already knew what was going to happen before we ever got here. And we're just going to lean into you. We don't have to have all the answers, figure out all the formulas. You are the answer, so we're going to lean into you. But we're grateful that you're guiding us, adjusting us, and teaching us what the new normal is going to look like so we don't have to waste time on, on rabbit trails and stuff like that. I'm asking that hope would arise in our hearts and lives, that faith would be stirred up and that we would lean in as the body of Christ and help us to celebrate your goodness, your mercy, your victory, your kingdom in this season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey guys, before we dismiss, take a moment, go to newcovenantchurch.com, click on the connect button, leave us a prayer request. We'd love to pray for you this week. Uh, if you'd like an altar minister to call you, go to newcovenantchurch.com, click on that connect button, leave us a phone number, and one of our altar ministers will call you within 24 hours. I bless you in Jesus' name that you will identify some of the old things that don't work anymore so you can let them go. But I bless you also with some new patterns that are happening in your life that you can lean into so that we can see you walk in victory, that you can walk in success. I bless you in this season of your life with peace, hope, and love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys.